It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So begins Dickens, his tale of two cities. Similarly, the counterculture movement was much of a duality. Ever since its start in the 1960s, the movement has always been at odds with its antagonist, the mainstream culture of the US and Western and Northern Europe of the time. This duality and its byproducts, such as violence, created ambiguity as to the positive and negative aspects of such a movement to the society as a whole. Though many will regard the 1970s as the end of the counterculture movement, counterculture itself never truly concluded and instead became appropriated by the mainstream culture. Today, counterculture is an alternative lifestyle, a mode of expression or social system that, as the term itself suggests, counters the dominant or normative one and often leads to changes in that system. Generally speaking, the counterculture of the 1960s is a series of individual anti-establishment movements that stemmed from a general threat to the American dream and are loosely connected based on their ultimate goals of truth and personal freedom. In this period of time, the American youth created communities where they experimented with different forms of social structures and recreational substances. There was also an anti-war consensus during the time of the Vietnam War, as well as a general disapproval of the acts of the government and large establishments at the time by the American youth in public. In the next clip, Professor Paul Bryans of WSU describes the consensus towards the war and student protests and activism by his fellow classmates at the time when the professor was a student of WSU himself in his lecture in 2006, Art of the Counterculture in the 1960s. The Vietnam War was intensely unpopular with many young people for many reasons. One, it was built on lies. Two, it constituted an illegal intervention in what was essentially a civil war, mistakenly hoping to keep enemies from our own shores. Three, we had allied ourselves with unreliable and corrupt leaders. Four, the principal victims were innocent civilians, mostly women and children. And five, no amount of resources poured into the effort or lives lost seemed to move as an inch out of a seemingly endless quagmire. Sound familiar? The campaign year, after a highly successful initial beginning for anti-war forces, turned into a huge disappointment, with no alternative for those who wished to vote for peace. That fall, SDS staged an anti-election protest on the west side of Holland, hanging the candidates in effigy. Similar values could be seen reflected through art. The art of this time is rebellious. It contradicts the traditions of established art culture where art is carefully crafted to convey an atmosphere or message. This is most clearly seen in Andy Warhol's Marilyn Diptych, where Monroe's headshot is displayed 50 times in various colors and saturations. Though it makes a statement about the life and young death of a celebrity, it argues for a no-brow mentality by displaying the once most beautiful and popular Hollywood actress in a mass-produced consumer goods format. Although members of the counterculture movement were able to express themselves through their art, their ideals remained an alien concept to the mainstream and thus was kept out of mainstream media and Hollywood. This is where Dennis Hopper comes in. In 1969, he produced the first successful low-budget indie film that not only shook Hollywood, but also represented the ideals and lifestyle of the counterculture. According to the biography on Dennis Hopper's own Art Trust Fund website, he was born in Dodge City, Kansas on a farm in 1936 to Jay and Marjorie Hopper, a railway mail serviceman and a swimming pool manager respectively. When he was young, his father Jay enlisted in the armed forces during the World War II and Dennis Hopper was sent to live with his grandparents just a few miles away from Dodge City. During this time, he would sell eggs with his grandparents by day and spend hours in closed theaters by night to watch movies. After his father returned from the war, his family relocated to San Diego, California because of his younger brother David's asthma. In San Diego, Dennis Hopper took an interest in photography and visual arts, joining classes in the Nelson Art Gallery to paint. By November of 1954, Hopper visited head of casting at Hal Roach Studios, Ruth Birch, with a reference letter from Swope and landed his first role in popular TV series, The Medic. 
This role led him to great opportunities, as well as his best friend, James Dean. After his role in The Medic, he filmed roles in Rebel Without a Cause and Giant. After the death of his best friend, James Dean, in a tragic accident, Hopper studied acting with famed actor Lee Strasberg in New York and won an international photography competition in Australia with a collection of five photos called The Pieces. After that, Hopper directed, wrote, and acted in Easy Rider along with a company of friends and freelancers. We've gone through the whole 60s, and the 60s have been such a fascinating time, and there have been no movies made that had anything to do with our reality. I mean, the movie that was made the year that uh, we made Easy Rider was Doris Day and Rock Hudson made Pillow Talk. The young kind of movies that were being made for kids were Beach Blanket Bingo, you know, with Frankie Avalon. They had very little to do with the reality of Haight-Ashbury or the reality of the hippie love ends. So much was happening at that moment. The visual arts were exploding. The music was exploding. All these creative things that happened. And basically, this was tapping into the end of it. Pop art had already happened. Rock and roll had already happened. The summer of love was over. A large part of the film's message is within the music. That song you just heard was the opening song of Easy Rider, Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf. Just like the start of the film, the lyrics describe a feeling of optimism and an unstoppableness of the counterculture movement to bring about meaningful change in the American mainstream culture. Beneath the sacred mountain and wander through the forest where the trees have This is Wasn't Born to Follow by The Birds and appears later in the film. This song is a psychedelic rock song, popular during the 60s. The lyrics reflect a desire to be free and a counterculture mentality to carve your own path in an unjust established system with traditional one-size-fits-all values. Just as important if not more important to the central message of Easy Rider and to communicating the hippie lifestyle to the general public are the scenes. This scene from Easy Rider represents the ideals of those in the counterculture movement, a world of transparency and personal freedom. They are people just like us from within our own solar system, except that their society is more highly evolved. I mean, they don't have no wars. They got no monetary system. They don't have any leaders because, I mean, each man is a leader. I mean, each man, because of their technology, they are able to feed, clothe, house, and transport themselves equally and with no effort. This scene describes a general distrust in the government stemming from the oppression of information, authorities not respecting the wishes of people, and the lack of morality of those in power. Why don't they reveal themselves to us is because if they did, it would cause a general panic. Now, I mean, we still have leaders upon whom we rely for the release of this information. These leaders have decided to repress this information because of the tremendous shock that it would cause to our antiquated systems. This scene reflects the hostility of mainstreamers towards those who express themselves untraditionally, making them unwelcome in many establishments. This is a perspective of youth counterculture not reflected in commercially successful films before. <laughs> I think she's cute. Didn't you? I guess we put him in a woman's cell, don't you reckon? Oh, I think we ought to put him in a cage in charge of admission to see him. <sighs> those are what are known as, uh, there are even scenes that reflect the 60s trend of communal living and distaste for cities. The ending of Easy Rider and the scenes that led up to it depict the downfall of anti-heroes Billy and Wyatt in the film, and warns against the downfall of the counterculture movement. According to Levi and his response to the film, the idealism and promise of the counterculture movement descended into drug and party culture towards the end of the 1960s. Dominated by characters similar to Billy and Easy Rider, who were ultimately only concerned about individual survival instead of genuine social change, as seen in his heavy focus on money throughout the film. It is because of this that the counterculture movement lost crucial unity and momentum, causing it to eventually dissolve in the 1970s without fully achieving the original goals.
1969, Dennis Hopper and company wrote, directed, and filmed Easy Rider in order to represent the ideals of the counterculture in Hollywood and to warn the people of possible dangers brought about by those exact same ideals. Easy Rider has become historically significant for its impact on Hollywood and the way it defined a culture. It used novel and innovative filming techniques that made it the first commercially successful indie low-budget film without the help of larger studios, and it gave the counterculture movement, its people, as well as the way of life it entails, the widespread recognition it long deserved. Most importantly, it helped to spark a new unity and further the lifespan of the movement that was nearing its end. After Easy Rider, Dennis Hopper would go on to produce the last movie just two years later, a critical commercial failure. He would then descend into drug and alcohol abuse in the 70s and 80s according to the Dennis Hopper Art Trust. After a rehabilitation program in 1985, he was back on track. His movie career eventually spent more than 55 years with more than 118 credits across productions according to TV Guide. Dennis Hopper sadly passed away on May 29, 2010 after a protracted battle with prostate cancer. However, his image will remain immortalized in his works, and his story will be told and retold as the man who broke Hollywood, and as the one who redefined a generation.